Jeremiah chapter 36. You know, Jeremiah is my book. I love the book of Jeremiah and the prophecies of Jeremiah, mostly because I see what went on in his day is going on in our day. There is a coldness towards the things of God. There is a rejection of truth. There is uh, self-gratification sought. They did what was right in their own eyes. They served God by the dictates of their own heart. And when truth was presented to them, they not only did not know what to do with it, but they mocked it. And we see the very same things in our day. And uh, Jeremiah preached for some 40 years. And even though there were people who were believers in the land, nowhere in the scriptures do we find where he ever had a convert. Can I say in our day and age, if you aren't running tens of thousands, they look at you like your church is a failure. I remind you that God doesn't see as man seeth. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And I remind you that Gideon had tens of thousands, and God said, you got too many. He got them down to 300, and then they went and done business. And so it's not about the numbers. It's about obedience to God. When we get to glory, you'll see that Jeremiah will be named with all the great ministers of all the eras because Jeremiah did do that which God called him to do. And friends, it's not about... Uh, what man sees or what man thinks, it's about being obedient to God. In chapter number 36, I have to read several verses so you get the context. And I will build a big foundation, uh, but I won't preach long once I get to preaching. But I am going to give you a lot because I don't get to preach this weekend. <laughs> Maybe, you never know. Jeremiah chapter 36, we'll begin our reading, verse number 1. Now forgive me, I will butcher some names in here, but I can't help it. And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am shut up. It means he was in prison. Uh, he was under house arrest. He wasn't able to go and preach like you and I. He was there because of preaching. He said, I am shut up. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore go thou... And read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. It may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return every one from his evil way, for great is the anger and the fury that the Lord hath pronounced against this people. And Baruch, the son of Neriah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book the words of the Lord's house. Now skip down to verse 13. Then Micaiah declared unto them all the words that he had heard, when Baruch read the book in the ears of the people. Therefore all the princes sent Jehudai, the son of Nethaniah, 
the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushai, unto Baruch, saying, Take in thine hand the roll wherein thou hast read in the ears of the people, and come. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took the roll in his hand and came unto them. And they said unto him, Sit down now and read it in our ears. So Baruch read it in their ears. Now it came to pass when they heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and other, and said unto Baruch, We will surely tell the king of all these words. And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? Then Baruch answered them, He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Then said the princes unto Baruch, Go, hide thee, thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where ye be. And they went in to the king into the court, and they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe and told all the words in the ears of the king. So the king sent Jehudai to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elishama the scribe's chamber, and Jehudai read it in the ears of the king, and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. Nevertheless, Elfnathan and Deliah and Jemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll, but he would not hear them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, that we have the house of God, that we can come and proclaim what thus saith the Lord. God, thank you, Lord, for the good singing we have enjoyed, the good prayer time, the good fellowship time. But now, Lord, it's preaching time, so I pray you'd use this unworthy vessel, and God, you'd speak to our hearts, and you'd help us to embrace the truths of thy word. Help us, Lord, to be all that you would have us to be, and God, help us, Lord, to make a difference in these days we live. Uh, Lord, much like Jeremiah's day is the day that we live in. Uh, and Lord, you can proclaim it, but many don't want to hear it. Uh, so Father, help us not to be weary in well-doing, but help us to be faithful and true. Help us to having done all to stand, stand therefore. Uh, Lord, you told Jeremiah you made him an iron pillar. Uh, and God, I pray you do the same for us, uh, that when the winds of adversity blows, we'll still stand. Uh, and God, when those uh, uh, that come against us uh, uh, would strive to shut us down, we would still stand. Uh, and God, you would be glorified uh, not in uh, 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 what we're able to do, but what you're able to do through us. Uh, now, Father, have your will and way around here tonight. Uh, send revival, meet every need of every heart, and be glorified in our midst. And we'll bless you and praise you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Uh, amen. Uh, there's a whole lot of context that we've got to address here, and let me just uh, uh, get to the uh, high points of it. But I want you to notice, first of all, the commandment to pin the Scriptures. Uh, uh, we find in verse number 1 uh, uh, that the Lord spoke to Jeremiah. In verse 2, he said, Take a roll of a book uh, and write therein all the words that I've spoken unto thee uh, against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee, uh, from the days of Josiah even unto this day. Uh, uh, you have to understand uh, the very book you're reading tonight, uh, uh, the book of Jeremiah, which is uh, 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 of the Word of God, uh, was not Jeremiah's writings. Uh, uh, Jeremiah just had Baruch pin down what God gave Jeremiah. Can I say, uh, uh, the Bible says uh, uh, the Word of God uh, was pinned down by holy men of old. Uh, and can I say, uh, this is the very words of God. They are the words of life. Uh, uh, can I say uh, this is inspired. Uh, it's infallible. Uh, 
This wasn't man's opinions or man's design. Uh, this came from the very mouthpiece of God. Uh, and my dear friends, it's just as up to date today uh, as it was the day Jeremiah penned it down. Uh, and God knew what we needed then. Uh, he knows what we need today. Uh, and God is not mocked. Uh, and his word will prevail, uh, for it is ever settled in heaven. Uh, and can I say we see the commandment to pen the scriptures. Today he doesn't command us to pen them, he commands us to preach them. Paul said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Can I help you with something? Your feelings will come and go. Your emotions will come and go. Your health will come and go. But the word of God abideth forever. Uh, it changes not. Uh, 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 put your faith in what God says, friend, uh, and you'll have a foundation that will carry you through regardless of what you face. Uh, so we see that the commandment to pen the scriptures, uh, notice the cause for penning the scriptures. Look in verse number 3. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. The reason God pinned down the word of God, it was our schoolmaster to bring us to the knowledge of sin for one reason. Uh, not so God could tell us we were sinners. Uh, so that we would realize we were sinners uh, and that God forgives sin. Uh, and that God will forgive us if we repent. Uh, uh, can I say, God who is a sovereign God, uh, God who told Jeremiah in chapter number one, uh, they wouldn't hear him. Uh, they was a stiff-necked people uh, and they was a hard-hearted people. Uh, but God in his compassion and God in his love still gave them opportunity after opportunity to repent. Uh, hey, aren't you glad? Uh, hey, God still gave an opportunity for sinners to repent. Uh, hey, why does God have us uh, preach the word of God so sinners will get saved? Uh, uh, so the saints of God will get right. Uh, so God will be glorified in it all. Uh, can I say... Even God looking at the hardness and the wickedness of their life and their hearts, and he's even pronounced judgment. He says, I'm going to give them no chance. Amen. This might be the very message that will change their hearts. You know what I say? Notice the ceremony going on without the Scriptures. Look at verse 6. Jeremiah speaking to Baruch says, Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people at the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. It may be they will present their supplication before the Lord. Now here's a crowd that didn't have the Bible. Here's a crowd that Jeremiah had preached to them for Mm, some 25 years they needed to repent needed to repent needed to repent God's going to bring judgment God's going to bring judgment you need to repent you're wicked put your idolatry away uh, put all your wickedness away uh, uh, it was not only their idol worship uh, they'd ignored the commandments of God uh, they'd taken wives from other nations uh, they desecrated the house of God they'd offered up false and strange sacrifice unto God they'd built groves and they had idols in their homes they prayed to and and God said, I'm sick of it all. Uh, repent, repent, repent. Uh, notice uh, they ignored the preaching. Uh, they ignored all the statutes of God. Uh, but they still had pomp and circumstance. They still went through the motions. They still had ceremony. They still went to church. Uh, they still had a fasting day. They still uh, uh, would pray. But it was all done in vain, my dear friends. Uh, can I say America is a religious nation? But can I say the vast majority of religion going on in America is done in vain because it's not done in accordance to the will of God. Notice the ceremony. Can I say? Even when we meet, there are people who come out for ceremony. If you haven't read that devotion this morning, read that devotion. There are people who come out to be seen. There are people who sing in a choir so they can say, I sing in a choir. They don't sing in a choir because they want to glorify Jesus. Because if they sang in a choir because they wanted to glorify Jesus, they'd be here more than just choir singing time. You're welcome. Uh, there are folks that come to church 
so that they can tell God I went to church because they're seeking his hand and not his face. There are folks who come to church because they think that pleases God. You know what pleases God? Not sacrifice, obedience. Notice the conviction from hearing the scriptures. Look at verse 16. Now it came to pass when they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and the other. You know what preaching the word of God does? It brings conviction to folks who aren't right with God. You know why there are some folks who will come on Sunday and it takes them a whole week to get back? They got to wait for the conviction to wear off. Some people, it takes them two or three weeks to get back. Uh, and when they do come, they have that sour prune face that I preach about Sunday morning. Uh, seriously. When you come to church and you come seeking God's face, you have no, nothing to complain about. When somebody comes and they have something to complain about, they didn't come to see Jesus. Huh? You wouldn't believe some of the things we, we get complaints about. Just talk to Brother Randy. You ever get any complaints, Brother Randy? No, never. Huh? Huh? Y'all want to be a deacon? Talk to him. He'll let you know. Huh? Why do people complain? Because they don't come to see Jesus. Can I help you with something? And I'm not even preaching yet. I don't know why I'm on all this. But I mean, you're here tonight. I don't, so I don't know why I'm on it. But let me just help you so you understand some things here about this. Can I help you with something? Listen. When people are right with God, the preacher don't preach too long. The singers don't sing too much. The testifying services don't go on too long. Huh? The altar call isn't too long. When people are right with God, you know what happens? After service, they still hang around. But when people aren't right with God, they never come back. Everything's always a problem. You know, they're the last one in, the first one to leave. Uh, because it's all about them. But you know what preaching does? Preaching brings conviction. I told you over the weekend I read a quote that if your preacher is always preaching and everything is always just wonderful, he's not doing his job. Because if you preach the Bible, I don't care who you are, somewhere along the line God's going to tell you, hey, you need to move up in this area. huh? Listen, I sit there and preachers get up and preach. I think, oh, me. Why is that? Because none of us have a halo. And what preaching really does is it gets the wrinkles out of our lives. You know why? Because he's coming back for a bride without spot, without blemish. Ah. And so preaching the word of God brings conviction. We see conviction from hearing the scriptures. Notice the contempt for the scriptures. Look at verse 23. I don't know about you, but this is scary right here. This is devilish right here. And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read the three or four leaves, he cut it with a penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until the, all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Hmm. Verse 24, Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants had heard all these words. I don't know about you, but that's scary. That the word of God would be presented and they pull out a pocket knife and cut it up and throw it on the fire. You know what is happening right now? That very king and that very fellow, Jehudai, are in hell in the fire wishing they would have listened to the word of God. Hmm? But let me just say this. They had contempt for it. They said, we will not bow our prideful heart to God. We'll do it our way. Now listen, Brother Brian. 
You may never ever see somebody pull out a pocket knife and start cutting up the Bible when preaching's going on in the church. But when people walk out and they ignore what God had to say, they're just as guilty as doing what these guys did. If we do not embrace and heed to what God says, we might as well cut it out of the Bible and throw it in the flames. Because in our heart, we're doing the same thing they did. It's a blessing to hear the word of God. Even when God tells us we're wrong, it's a blessing. Because then we can get right. Now notice if you will. And by the way, they just rejected the word of God. They rebelled against it. They ridiculed it. That's what people do when they don't heed the preaching. They reject it. Well, that's just the preacher's opinion. They rebel against it. Huh? No, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I don't know how many times you got to preach on faithfulness and people just aren't going to be faithful. You know what they're telling? God, I'm throwing your word. Hebrews 10, 25 is still in the book. Huh? I don't know how many times you got to preach on tithing. There are some people who just want to tip God instead of tithing. They just cut it out of the Bible. Throw it in the fire. They're rebelling against it. Hmm? Preach on putting God first, being obedient. Folks don't want to do it. There's coming a time they wish they would have. Notice the chilling response toward the pleas for the scriptures. Look at verse 25. And you want to know how a preacher feels? You find it verse 25. Nevertheless, Elnathan and Deliah and Jemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll, but he would not hear them. There's not a preacher I know that's not broken hearted after he preaches and he watched people that he knows that needed the message walk out and not do business with God. That is a chilling response when, when people will not hear what God had to say. That's horrifying. That's scary. That might be the last opportunity they get. Now notice the consequences. Now I know you're about to die. It's not going to be that bad. Hang in here. Just cut a little bit more farther. All right. Notice the consequences for not heeding the scriptures. Look at verse 29. And thou shalt say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast burned this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land, and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat and in the night to the frost, and I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity, and I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I pronounced against them, but they hearken not. There are consequences for our actions and what we do with the things of God. Now, if you know anything about royalty, royalty wants to leave an heir to take the throne. He said, you're not going to have anybody sit on the throne. There's a few kings in Israel's history that God pronounced it on. Guess what? To this day, they've never had anybody serve in the king's court. Why? Because God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now notice, though, the continuance of the Scriptures. You'd have thought, well, that's the end of the Bible. Na, nah, baba, nah. Look at verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein, therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim king of Judah had burned in the fire and there were added besides unto them, them many like words. Huh? Can I say tyrants have always tried to destroy the word of God. God just keeps penning it down. He just keeps publishing it. Huh? Today it's under attack. You got all the false Bibles. Isn't it amazing? We still got a Bible. Uh, uh, it's amazing this whole story deals with rejection of God's word and that's sad that people would reject the thing they need most but what I want to focus on is in verse 25 
And I've done preach longer than I'll preach. Maybe. Verse 25 says, nevertheless. Now, they didn't fear. They didn't hearken to the words. It says, nevertheless, Elnathan and Deliah and Jemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll, but he would not hear them. I want to preach on those three fellows interceding before the king. And this is what I want to preach on. I want to preach on interceding on behalf of the scriptures. Interceding on behalf of the scriptures. How can we intercede on behalf of the Scripture? Do you realize most of the world don't have a copy of the Scripture? Do you realize even in our community, if we knock door to door and we ask them if they had a Bible, if they have one and they brought it out and it's been bought in the last 30 years, they probably don't have the right one? They probably have to go get grandma's or grandpa's Bible that they keep stored up to have the right one? Do you realize most people don't have a copy of it? And you realize a lot of people that do, Brother Phil, never open it, never read it, never pay it any mind, any attention. Some people leave them in their uh, uh, cars until next time they go to church. Some people leave them here at church till they come back. Uh, I, I mean, some people, they just say it's not that important to them. Uh, uh, we need to intercede on behalf of the Scriptures. Uh, we need to let people know that in, these, in this book, this wonderful, miraculous book, uh, it contains the words of life. Uh, in this book, uh, it has the answers for all the questions of life. Uh, in this book, uh, you'll find exactly what it takes to have a life of joy and hope and peace. Uh, uh, within the pages of this book, you find the good way, uh, and you're to walk therein. Uh, you'll find rest for your soul uh, uh, all your heart's desires can be met through and by the pages of this book my dear friends uh, and so we need to intercede on behalf of the scriptures uh, I was reading something from a missionary this week and he said he was somewhere in Alabama and this is a seasoned missionary and this seasoned missionary was in Alabama and this church was looking for a pastor and one of the men that was on the pulpit committee talked to this missionary and said, pray for our church that we can get a young preacher in here that can win this generation. And this missionary said, well, why would I pray that? How about we pray the will of God? Because the only one that's going to win any generation is God. Why don't we get God's man and then he'll take care of the rest? I thought, hallelujah. You see, but we have a mindset in America that you got to have a circus to get young people in uh, and that you got to uh, 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 bastardize the scriptures uh, and use a modern version so everybody can understand it uh, and you got to go to popular rock music in order for folks uh, uh, to enjoy it. Uh, well, I want to tell you something. Uh, uh, there's no substitute for old-fashioned worship. Uh, there's no substitute with singing that's got God on it uh, uh, because it exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's no substitute for... For the Word of God uh, and the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, there's no substitute uh, uh, for getting our children see uh, what old time worship is, uh, what holy worship is, uh, what an altar's really about. Uh, uh, the only dance in the Odyssey uh, is when the Holy Ghost of God gets so real you get a good case and it can't help it. Uh, and they need to see uh, what it is to have a shadow of a king amongst God's people. Uh, they need to see. Uh, what it is when God floods the sanctuary with his presence. Uh, so we need to intercede uh, on behalf of the scriptures because you can't have any of it if you don't have the right foundation. Well, how? How can we do this, preacher? Well, first of all, we must present the case for them. Now, I said I wanted to preach on these three fellows. The first fellow mentioned is Elnathan. Well, I looked up what that fellow's name meant. Because you know, if you've uh, been here any length of time, that any man's name mentioned in the Bible, it tells something about his character 
because once he reached the age of 30 under Bible days, if your name did not fit your character, they would change your name. Brother Phil, if Brother Phil don't mean crazy wild Christian, we'd change it to whatever it would mean crazy wild Christian, huh? That's what they would do. So what does Elnathan mean? It tells us something about this guy. I mean, this guy's interceding to the king not to burn the scriptures. Well, Elnathan simply means God hath given. And the case we need to make for the word of God is that it is the word of God. Uh, God gave it. Uh, uh, he wasn't some intellectual crowd uh, that got together and decided what would be best for this generation. Uh, hey, I want to tell you who gave this book. Uh, God said, uh, and there it is. Uh, God pinned it down. Uh, God preserved it. Uh, God gave it to us. Uh, and it's all the words of God. Uh, my dear friends, he's given it. Uh, and if God gave it, uh, hey, listen, uh, they can't do away with it uh, because there's no door he opens that man's able to close uh, and no door he closes man's able to open. Uh, this is a very gift of God just like his son on Calvary was. Uh, thank God for the word of God. Uh, we must present the case for it. Uh, can I say he gave us the word? He gave us the scriptures so we could know the word of God. Much preaching today is the philosophy of man. I was talking to Brother Greg today. He's talking about what we've seen in the years we've been preaching. Trust me, I know preachers have been preaching a lot longer than me. But I said this to Brother Greg, and he amen me. I said, you listen to a lot of preaching today, and all it is is fluff. All it is is designed to make people feel better about themselves, or it's designed to get some kind of positive reaction. It's not the Word of God. I listen to a lot of preachers. They'll read a text, and then they never tell you what the text says. Again, I tell you, Paul said, preach the word. Mm -mm. He didn't say preach somebody's philosophy. He didn't say preach this or preach that. He didn't say to preach to be popular. Paul preached and he got his head chopped off. But he said, preach the word. Be in in season, out of season. He said, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And can I say, we must present them that God hath given them he gave them so we know the word of God listen I might ask your opinion about something every now and then do you like this shade or this color do you like this or do you like that but if I want something that I'm going to bank my soul on for eternity I'm going to consult God and see what God says we have the word of God you want to know if it's right consult God You want to know if it's wrong? Consult God. You want to know if God's pleased? Consult Him. And not only must we present them that He gave them because we can know the Word of God, but we could also know the works of God. Without the work, the Word of God, we wouldn't know the work of creation. We'd believe what everybody else believes, that somebody climbed out of a of a, a pond somewhere or some amoeba and turned into two amoebas and turned into a plant and then turned into a monkey and then turned into Aaron. I can make a case for that. Uh, I mean, they believe this junk. They believe there was a great explosion in space and that's what all them stars are out there and everything. And they used to keep looking and building all these telescopes to look at all these galaxies and all that stuff out there and they say it had to happen that way. There's no other explanation. Yeah, there is. There's God's Word. And every time they find more stuff out there, it just tells them how great God is. Because He made all that and He made one planet with people on it. And in all that out there, God, His throne is in the sides of the north. His throne is far above all that out there. And God can look to all them stars and all that space and all them galaxies and all that Milky Way and all that. And God can look all the way down into the heart of you and me and see what we need of. What a work that God did all that. 
the work of creation. Then there's the work of the cross. Jesus went and bled and died for your sin and my sin. Only God could send his only begotten son to pay for our sin. And that he died according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures. Uh, he was buried in a borrowed tomb because he wasn't going to need it very long. Uh, and my dear friends, he rose again victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Uh, got the keys uh, of it all. Uh, and my dear friends, he did that so you and I could have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. Not only that, the works of conversion... It amazes me how many Baptists got conversion wrong. Conversion is not turning over a new leaf. Conversion is not deciding to follow Jesus. Conversion is not, well, I'm going to give Jesus a try this week. Conversion uh, is sitting under the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, because God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. Uh, and under the preaching of the Word of God, uh, uh, you realize you have a need of a Savior because you're lost. Uh, and my dear friends, you've broken the law of God. Uh, and you're on your way to hell. And you deserve to go there and pay for your own sins. Uh, but God, who is rich in mercy, has loved you. Uh, and God will save you uh, if you'll repent of your sins. Uh, and you'll humbly bow before Him and accept Him as your only means of salvation uh, and when you do that you become a new creature in Christ because he washes away your sins in his blood and he seals you into the day of redemption and my dear friends it's more than a decision it's a life changing event because it changes you from the inside out why do you think so many people sit in Baptist churches and they realize somewhere along the line hey I made a decision, but I've never been born again. Thanks be unto God, God's long-suffering, and he takes the blinders off, and they realize they need to be born again. But why do you think that happens? Uh, because somewhere along the line, they were presented just make a decision. How about just get born again? It's a work of conversion. You know, say... He gave them so we can know not only the words of God, the works of God, but the will of God. It's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You understand that's the will of God. That's the will of God for every generation. And can I say, if that's the will of God, that ought to be the will of the church. The will of the church is that every man should repent. Every woman should repent. Every child should repent. It should be the will of the church and the desire of the church to see every sinner get saved. And we ought to do everything within our means to make that happen. Say, what can we do? All we can do is present it. All we can do is pray for them. All we can do is let them know and keep the doors open and have God on us when they get here. So we see Elnathan means God hath given. We must present the case for the Scriptures. Can I say, if we're going to intercede on behalf of the Scriptures, we must be prostrate before God in delivering them. Delaya simply means the poor before the Lord. And can I say to be prostrate before God means to lay low, to get on your face before God. I'm reminded of what John the Baptist said. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. The reason that we don't intercede for the scriptures very much as we don't get prostrate before God very often. Can I say, if we're going to be the poor before the Lord, we must be broken. We must be broken that people don't use the right Bible. We must be broken that preachers aren't preaching the right gospel. We must be broken that sinners are not repenting and getting born again. We must be broken that the will of God has not been the will of the church. Uh, We must be broken uh, uh, that God is not glorified in every facet of our lives. Uh, And then after we're broken, we must become burdened. When you get broke before God, you'll get a burden to do something for God. There have been people over the years that I have pastored I told my wife, I said, I've never seen them broken. You 
You know what I never see, Brother Josh, when people aren't broken? I never see a burden. Because you'll not have a burden without being broken. Now, can I say this? On any given week, any one of us could get cold towards the things of God. You live in a fierce world. You live in a busy world going at supersonic speed, and everything in the world is geared about getting your mind off the things of God. You live in a body, and your flesh does not like the things of God. Your flesh don't like sitting in service for four hours, although I couldn't tell you last time we did that. But every Sunday, your flesh thinks it's going to be today. Huh? Your flesh don't like the things of God. It will war with your inward man. And so you can get cold because of the world and because of your flesh. And I guarantee you, old Slewfoot don't want you to be on fire. And he'll throw everything he can at you Every snare, every thought he can put in your mind, he'll get you thinking everybody in the church is against you. He'll get you thinking all kinds of goofy stuff because he wants to get your mind off of doing business with God. And can I say, any given week, that can be any one of us. But you go years without getting broke. And I'm not talking about being down at the First Baptist Church of the Snobs. I'm talking about being around here. You can go years without being broke. You got something really bad going on in here. You're either so bitter and hateful towards the things of God that the things of God bounce off of you, or you don't know God. You will never be able to intercede on behalf of the Scriptures until we get broken. And then when we get broken, we'll get a burden. You know what happens after you get broken? Everybody you see, you think they need Jesus. They need Jesus. You don't see piercings and tattoos and bad habits. You see they need Jesus. They need Jesus. You don't see all their faults and failures, and you don't see what hog pen they've been in. You see they need Jesus. They need Jesus. Mm, we must be broken then we must be burdened and when you get broken and then you get burdened then you become bold enough to deliver the scriptures you know why some people say oh, I, just can't, I just can't tell anybody about Jesus it's because you're not broken and burdened you get broken burdened you'll tell somebody about Jesus because you're afraid you're going to die if you don't you'll get bold enough to tell your boss bold enough to tell the president it won't matter because you got a burden for him you would rather as Paul said he said he'd rather be accursed he said that, that I myself would be accursed that Israel might be saved he said if it were possible I'd die and go to hell that Israel would get saved now that's a burden when you get broke you'll get a burden and then you'll be bold enough to tell people about Jesus the third and final thing about interceding on behalf of the scriptures. Not only present the case for them, not only be prostrate before God in delivering them, but we must promote their powerful attributes. Jemariah means the perfection of the Lord. And I say the word of God does not contain errors. And can I say the scriptures do not contain the word of God? You've got to listen to some of these Bible correctors that say, well, I believe the Bible contains the Word of God. No, the Bible is the Word of God. It doesn't contain it. To contain it means it might not contain it. All of it might not be it. No, it is the Word of God. And it does not have 30,000 errors, as the Bible correctors will tell you. If you've got a King James Bible in your lap, as you read it, you'll notice there's some italicized words in there. There's some 33,000 italicized words uh, uh, in your Bible that has uh, uh, 11, over 1,100 chapters, over 66 books, over 793,000 words. 33,000 are italicized. What does that mean? That means the language that it was translated from, if it would have been pinned down exactly the way that it came from the other language, it wouldn't have made sense in our language. 
so forth to mean in our language what it meant in that language, they had to add the italicized word. That's just letting you know that's our English word to give it the proper meaning. Doesn't mean it contains errors. Just means that's how syntax had to be applied in order for it to make sense. Otherwise, it would just be random words. But in order for it to be congruent, to make sense and have meaning, and to be exactly the way it had meaning in the former language, it had to have the italicized words. But these goofy Bible correctors, once you tell them that, once you tell them that it is the Word of God, then they'll say something like this, well, you know King James was a homosexual. Who gives a flip? He didn't pin it down anyway. He just commissioned for it to be pinned down. It's, it's just like liberals today. When you nail them to a wall, they're going to come up with something. Well, Donald Trump doesn't comb his hair the right way. Who cares? They always want to defer from the task at hand and the truth at hand. What can I say? We need to promote their powerful attributes because it is perfect and it makes us perfect before the Lord. Now, the word perfect does not mean sinless when it's mentioning us. Now, the word of God is sinless. But when it comes to us, how are we perfect? Not that we ever attain sinless perfection in this flesh, but that we become complete, we become mature, we become a whole in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that happens through the Scriptures. What can I say? They're perfect in their authority. We know God pinned it down because man would have left out a whole lot of this stuff. Man would have left out all the bad parts. Man would have wrote down here, Man needs a village to raise them. Man would have said, you know, instead of saying, spare the rod, spoil the child, you know, man would have said, don't whip them, give them timeouts. Uh, man wouldn't have called them fornicators, they would have called having relations. And man wouldn't have called them mm, sodomites, man would have called them alternate lifestyles. Man wouldn't have called them drunks and sinners. Man would have called them having a disease of alcoholism. God just called it like it was. They're perfect in their authority. God pinned it down. And every page testifies to the holiness of God. The Word of, the word of God glorifies God and gives Him the preeminence in everything. What can I say? They're perfect in their accuracy. You can study the Word of God, and it's a lot more accurate than your theory of relativity. I can show you in the Word of God quantum physics long before we even knew what quantum physics even was, how it was spelled, let alone the concept behind it. Jesus passed through walls. Walls, they were in the upper room. Door was locked. Jesus appeared. How'd he get there? quantum physics I got news for you so did Ezekiel God moved him all over the city hmm? how quantum physics because nothing's impossible with God huh? do you uh, 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 know that they have studied for over a century uh, the great barrier reef and how much it grows every year and how many inches or feet or whatever it grows and you know uh, 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 they can prove that that thing is exactly the same age as the flood because it, it dates right back to the flood hmm. go up there to the museum and read do you know you can find every measure of dirt every kind of dirt in the entire globe you can find it in the Grand Canyon don't tell me there wasn't a universal flood. Uh, the Bible, nature just proves the Bible. It's accurate. Everything God said would happen has happened or it will happen because it's impossible for God to lie. They're accurate to a T. What can I say? They're perfect in their actions. In the Word of God, we find they're perfect in the peace they provide. Only God can take a madman who they bind to, with chains to tombs and no man could control him and God speak to him 
and they find him clothed in his right mind. Can I say, uh, only the worst of sinners that I've seen come to Jesus and you find them at peace finally. huh? Because the words of life are words of peace. He said, my peace I live with you. Not peace as the world knows. My peace I live with. He's the prince of peace. Can I say, they're perfect in the paths that they lead you through. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Hmm? Only God does that through the scriptures. Thy word is a light unto my feet, a lamp, a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. What, what are you saying, preacher? The word of God can lead you through life in the right paths to where you lay down in green pastures. Every one of us in here tonight, we all got problems. We all have heartaches. We all have things that if God doesn't work, We, we were concerned about things. But the bottom line is, because the Word of God's part of our life, we're not consumed with that. Because God's never failed us yet. Why would He start failing us now? And yeah, it may look dismal on the horizon, but I look back and see He's been there all the time. You know, and He'll be there again tomorrow. Who do you think wakes the sun up every day, God? Mm -mm. Uh, because they're perfect in the paths that they lead you through. may not always been the path I would have chosen, but it's always the right path. And can I say this? They're perfect in the many proofs they've established in changing lives. You know how I know the King James Bible is the Word of God? Just look at all the lives it's changed for the last 500 years. Just look at the people's lives that's changed. Hmm. You know, the NIV crowd, every year they got to come up with a new theme and a new production and a new something to get people excited, a new movement. You know why? Because they don't have the scriptures. All we need is somebody get up and pull the Holy Ghost, preach the Word of God, and look out. We'll get some help. Hmm. Now listen. You say, Brother Doug, because here's the critics. Here's the crowd that's not here when they listen to this on Sunday. This is what they're going to say. They say, Brother Doug, why should we intercede on behalf of the Scriptures? What's the use? The king didn't hear them. Isn't that what it said? He's not talking about they didn't hear the Word of God. He burnt the Word of God. It says, but he would not hear them. Who? These three fellows. He wouldn't listen to what they had to say, and he burnt the scriptures. Brother Doug, what's the use? Why should we preach it? Why should we tell folks about it? Why should we live it? What's the use? They're not listening. They won't hear them. No. But God did. Yeah, they may not hear them, but God will. Let, let God be true and every man a liar. If nothing else, I want to go out doing what God wants me to do. If nobody else ever listens, I want to be right with God. But can I help you with something? God not only listened, but others did too as a result of their interceding. Jeremiah got to writing it down again. We don't know, won't know till we get to heaven how many people did get right with God after the fact because the word of God was pinned down. If they wouldn't have interceded, God might tell Jeremiah, just quit writing. What's the use? No, somebody was interceding. God said, keep writing, boy. Just add a little bit of this and add a little bit of that. Uh, add, add that, I've loved thee with an everlasting love in there. Put that in there. Put in there, Jeremiah, put this in there. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Put that in there, Jeremiah. Somebody might need that. Put that in there. Huh? Huh? Now listen, God gave me this thought today, and I pinned it down. Why should we intercede on behalf of the Scriptures? Not only the Scriptures, we ought to intercede on behalf of sinners. We ought to intercede on behalf of the saints of God, praying one for another. That's what the Bible teaches. But why should we intercede at all? 
Y'all can get me a start. I put it in. Interceding is inspiring to God. You go study the scriptures, how many people called on God that moved, moved the heart of God to move towards men? Abraham did for Lot. Hmm? Hannah interceded and God heard her prayer, gave her a child. Are you listening? Huh? Jesus interceded, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> Interceding is inspiring to God. That's what touches God's heart when we get so concerned that we intercede. That's when God does something. When we get broken and a burden and get bold enough to do something about it, that inspires God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. You want the secret to revival? You want a secret to a movement of God? Start interceding and watch the hand of God show up and do great and mighty things. You know what we need to start doing? Less talk and a whole lot more interceding and watch and see what God does. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song. Maybe you need to come intercede right now. Maybe you need to intercede on behalf of somebody that's out of the will of God. Maybe you need to intercede on behalf of somebody that's lost. Maybe somebody at work. You need to ask God to give you boldness to witness to them. Maybe God's dealt with you about something else tonight. That's what this altar's for. Maybe it's been a long time since you've been broken. You just need to ask God to deal with your heart. Break your heart for sinners again. Break your heart for the house of God again. Break your heart for the things of God again. Folks are coming. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, I know there's a whole lot to throw out there. Lord, I had to deal with them ignoring the word of God because that's where we live today. So many don't want to hear it. God, I believe those three fellows, Lord, it touched their hearts. They interceded. Tried to tell the king, king, you don't want to do this. You can't fight against God and win. God, give us some intercessors today. Some that pray. Some that praise. Some that pass out tracts. Just give us folks to get broken and burdened. Stand before God. And make a difference in a lost and dying world. God, help us, Lord, to do more than just show up was to get real and serious with the things of God because there's so many in the balance on their way to hell. God, somebody needs to stand up and make a difference. Now, God bless this invitation. Speak to hearts. Help us, Lord, to intercede on behalf of the Scriptures, on behalf of the sanctuary, on behalf of sinners, saints of God. Lord, those prodigals out there in the hog pens, God, help us, Lord. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.